Right, good morning everybody. Um, to those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike, Mike Cooper. Uh, the vicar's not actually on holiday, but he is on holiday sort of thing. So I was asked, actually I was, I was detailed, to step in and look after you all. So welcome to our old age worship. It's lovely to see families. Uh, we're going to be involving you as we go through, so don't sit down and get too comfortable. We might, uh, we might need your help. So, we're sort of topsy-turvying things. We had some bad news last week that John Locke has had to go to hospital yet again for two or three things that have happened. So, um, I'm just going to ask if we can pray quietly just for a few seconds for John. As far as I know, he's not home yet, but uh, we're all very fond of him. And now he's in his 91st year. We want him to have a few more years, don't we? Lord, we know that he's in your care and we look after June for both of them. We pray very hard that it's only just a hiccup and possibly he'll be home soon, back to where he loves to be. Amen. Now, our theme today is about a gentleman who... He, he just wouldn't understand what was going on after all the information and things that happened during Jesus' crucifixion and the resurrection and the tomb and all the other things. And we've moved on one bit. So we're now looking forward very much so to the wonderful resurrection and the fact that Jesus was able to look after the disciples. But there was one that was not quite so happy. Anybody got a name for that person? Apart from Judas, we've got rid of him, but there's still one. Well, if I, if I just say a few words, doubt, not so sure, uh, wants, wants to be told, wants to be shown, and we're going to try and do that today. So Jan was just going to stop me. Were you going to say? Yes, precisely. So doubting Thomas, we often hear that, don't we? But we have that in our own lives, surely. We often do things, whether you're a family, whether the children are upsetting you, whether the children themselves are upsetting, and they often get, we all get worried. All of us have moments of doubt. We, we wonder if God is listening. We wonder if God cares. We even wonder if there even is a God. But it's through those times when we do have problems and our faith becomes stronger that's why we're Christian and why we're sitting here this morning. With God's help, our doubts will be transformed into faith. And that may take a long, long time. It may take many, many years. But if we keep thinking in that same way, we're here to help. Can we have the call to worship, Barry? The call to worship's in two bits, but, but every time you see, you're used to this anyway, aren't you? If you're anything you see black, bold, you join in with me. This is a call to worship. We come as those with doubt. We come as those in need of forgiveness. We come as those slow to proclaim you as our Lord and our God. We come as those longing to hear your words of peace. So we pray together. Lord Jesus, come to us as you came to Thomas and set us free to worship you without hesitation and without fear. Amen. Our gathering prayer. God, whose light shines in the darkness, shine on us today. God, made known to those who met Jesus, touch us through the experiences of our lives. God, who gave Thomas what he asked, give us what he needs, that we too may come to believe. Amen. And we'll stand now for our first hymn, Jesus Stand Among Us at the Meeting of Our Lives. I'm going to switch myself off now. So Jesus Stand Among Us at the meeting of our lives Be a sweet agreement At the meeting 
meeting of our eyes Oh Jesus, we love you So we gather here Join our hearts in unity And take away our fear So to you we're gathering Out of each and every land Christ the love between us At the joining of our hands Oh Jesus we love you So we gather here Join our hearts in unity And take away our fear. Please sit. I've, you saw Mark come up. I've done thing, one thing I shouldn't have done. Have we got to, have we got to just... The wonderful thing that we can now do, of course, is to light, we, light, we lit candles, didn't we, do you remember? Just leading in the weeks leading up to Easter. Sad times and now good times. So if I can manage to do this. <laughs> You've got the wrong person in charge this morning. Am I lighting it? Oh. Hooray. Right. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful news that Jesus is with us. And even though we may not be able to hear him or see him, but in our minds we can pray and look after. I'm going to hand you over now to Marion. I hope this is working. Is it? No. It says it should be. That's better? Okay, thank you. It's very hard sometimes to know if what we're being told... Sorry. It's very hard to know if what we're being told is true. Things some, sometimes sound plausible, but they're actually not true. And other times, things um, are made up, but they seem to be made up, but they are untrue. The unbelievable is true. Have any of you, do any of you listen to that uh, Radio 4 program called The Unbelievable Truth? Six, yes, <laughs> I can see a hand up there. It's a panel game, 6.30 on Radio 4. I do recommend it. Um, and there are panelists who take it in turns to read a passage of statements, a, a series of statements about a prepared theme. And amongst those statements are some extraordinary claims. Um, and the other members of the panel have to spot which is the one that, sat, that might be true. A lot of them sound true, even the one that isn't true might sound true, but they have to spot it, and they, they earn a point every time they guess one, um, which is true, although it doesn't, might not sound it. And then they lose a point if they think that something is true, and it isn't. So that's the way the game is played, it's great fun. And we are this morning going to have the unbelievable quiz. So I'm going to see what you think of some of these questions. And I want you to put your hand up if you think it's true, and then I'll ask you to put your hand up if you think it's false. Now, these questions, I didn't know the answer to any of these, um, but that doesn't matter. I just want you to, think, to tell me if you think it's plausible or if you think it's definitely not true. So, a bit of fun, really. So, the first one is, all elephants walk on tiptoe. Now, think about it. Elephants are very heavy. Is that likely? Okay, please put your hand up if you think it might be true. 
right? That means the rest of you think it is false. Could you put your hand up just to verify? Right, the majority think it's false. Okay, let's have a look and see what the answer is. It's true. The back port, this is because the back portion of their foot is made up entirely of fat with no bone, so it wouldn't support their weight. So, yes, they do walk on tiptoe. Here's the next one. If you cut the head off a cockroach, it could still live for a month. Put your hand up if you think that might be true. Ooh, right. Put your hand up if you think it might be false. Yes, all right. Let's see what the answer is. It's false, but the true answer is it could only last for a week. <laughs> Next one. Research has shown that people with ginger hair require 20% more anaesthetic before surgery than people with hair of other colours. Right, so if you've got ginger hair, you need more anaesthetic. True? Not many people think that. It's such a silly statement, it must be true. <laughs> right, who thinks it's false? Yeah, all right, let's have a look. It's true. Right. No, I don't think there are any ginger-haired people here. But some people might have been ginger-haired in their, in their childhood. It changes a bit. Right, next one. Rats laugh when they're tickled. Right. And there's a lovely picture of a rat being tickled. I don't think I'd fancy that, but anyway. Who, put your hand up if you think it's true. No, oh, one, two people think it's true. Okay, who thinks it's false? Most of you, yes. Let's have a look. It's true. Now, the next one is not on the screen, but I'm just going to tell you anyway. We didn't have the right picture for it, so we had to leave that one out. I didn't want to mislead you. Um, identical twins. Their DNA means that they will have identical fingerprints. How about that? Identical fingerprints. Put your hand up if you think that's true. Yeah, okay. And false? Yes, everybody thinks it's false. What's the answer? Of course, we've, we've left that one out as well. It's false. It's false. So you're right. The majority are right. Number six. We'll go on to that one. Your feet have half a million sweat glands that can produce over a pint of fluid every day. True? One or two. False? Okay, let's see what the answer is. It's true. Doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Right, next one. Tigers have stripy skin underneath their fur. True? A few. False? About half and half, I think. The answer is that it's true. They do have stripy skin underneath their fur. Who'd have thought it? Number eight. Although they usually live in Antarctica, penguins have been successfully introduced to the North Pole. True? Not many. False? Yeah. Okay. And the answer is, you're right, it's false. All right, number nine, nearly there. Doctor Who's home planet is Scaro. Is that right? Put your hand up if you think that's right. Right, put your hand up if you think it's wrong. Does anybody actually know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're not basing this on knowledge, you're basing it on probability. So the answer is no, it's not, it's false. Uh, Doctor Who's home planet is Gallifrey. Right, last one. If a flounder fish lies upon a chessboard, 
it can quickly change the colouring of its body to match the pattern of the chessboard. Yes or no? True? A few. False? Okay. And the answer is true. So there we are. There we have it. The un some things that you thought were believable were not. Some things you thought were not believable were true. All right. Now, Mark is going to read us our Bible story about somebody who didn't really believe what he was seeing or, or being told. And this comes from St. John's Gospel. Thank you, Marion. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And now Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet who have believed. And now the purpose of John's Gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That concludes our reading for today. Now our second hymn, song, whatever, follows really what Mark has just read to us with those wonderful um, slides that we've seen. So can we, um, can we stand then to sing from heaven you came?
I've called this talk, Would You Believe It? Our Bible story today is in two parts, one leading on from the other. They each have a message for us, so I'm going to deal with them separately. Part one is about fear. All of us are afraid of things sometimes. We wouldn't be human if we didn't feel fear. It's a perfectly normal reaction to anything which seems threatening. Let's start with things that lots of us are afraid of. Spiders. Anybody afraid of spiders? Yes. Let me tell you my best spider story. We'd just moved into a new house and I was sitting up in bed and suddenly there was a big two and a half incher crawling up the yellow bedspread straight towards me very quickly. Now, I did what any girl would have done. I stood up, screamed, and called for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't like that. That was the worst one. I don't mind spiders outside, but inside they don't belong, and I, I don't like them, particularly the big ones. I'm sure lots of us share that. How about wasps? Sometimes we have reason to be fe uh, fearful of wasps if we're allergic to the, to the stings, for example. Thunderstorms. Yeah? Maybe. Um, we have one of our daughters, when she was little, um, used to like, I, I say that in inverted commas, she used to like watching Doctor Who, but she would hide behind the settee to watch the episode and just poke out every, every so often. Maybe going to a new school or something like that. There are all sorts of things we might be frightened of. On the first Easter day, when Jesus had been seen alive again by only a few of his disciples, 10 of them met together in a room that night and they locked the door firmly. And we're told in our Bible story for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now the disciples of course themselves were Jews, but they were afraid of the leaders because the authorities, the Orthodox Jews um, were, were hostile to Jesus and his teaching and therefore would be hostile to the disciples. So what they did to Jesus, the disciples were afraid was going to happen to them. They were afraid the Jews would round them up, hand them over to the Romans, and they would also be crucified. That's why they were frightened. That's why they were in a locked room. Then suddenly, Jesus was there in the room with them. They thought it must have been a ghost, because how did he get in? But Jesus was no ghost. He showed them his hands with the nail marks and his side which had been pierced with the sword. They could see he was real. Jesus saw how frightened they were and he said, peace be with you. Don't be frightened, in other words, peace be with you. And he breathed the Holy Spirit onto them. The disciples then lost their fear and felt brave again, ready to obey Jesus' instructions. So next time we're feeling fear, not just of spiders and thunderstorms and wasps, but maybe of being ill, going into hospital for an operation, of losing a job, of getting old and weak, of dying, we can feel Jesus' peace if we sincerely ask him for it to give us courage. And we could spread that peace to others who are facing fear. Now we turn to part two of the story, which follows on from the first one, but this one is about doubt, another very human reaction. The disciple Thomas wasn't with the others when they met Jesus that night. We're not told where he was, but when he came back and they excitedly told him they'd seen Jesus alive, he was naturally rather skeptical. To justify himself, he made the condition that he would need physical proof of it before he could believe such nonsense. He'd seen Jesus hanging on the cross. He knew he'd been buried, but he hadn't had the same experience as the other disciples in that room and probably thought they were imagining things when they said they'd seen Jesus. He probably said the equivalent of, you're kidding, or in John McEnroe's 
in immortal words, you cannot be serious. His nickname, therefore, is Doubting Thomas. A week later, the same event was repeated and Jesus appeared through locked doors. And this time, Thomas was with the others. Jesus knew perfectly well what Thomas's attitude had been. And he invited him to touch his hands and his side as proof that he was alive. But by that stage, Thomas didn't need to touch him. As Jesus spoke to him directly, Thomas knew immediately that it was Jesus and gave him a full confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Now, Jesus wasn't going to let Thomas off quite so easily. He knew that Thomas had believed when he'd seen the physical proof, but told Thomas that it would be better if he'd believed without seeing the evidence. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Bible tells us that Jesus appeared on so many occasions that those around him were convinced and empowered to share the good news. The Christian church grew and spread despite the efforts of the authorities to suppress it. There is a tradition that Thomas traveled to South India to preach the gospel and founded the Christian church there so his faith by then was very firm. Now, fast forward to the present day. Where do we stand in all this? I think many of us would identify very strongly with Thomas, and although we want to, we may find it hard to believe in the resurrection. After all, it goes against nature, doesn't it? Dead men don't, just don't come to life again. Maybe we should call him Honest Thomas, we haven't had the chance that Thomas had the second time round, and we may have honest doubts that the resurrection really happened. In church, we regularly say, on the third day he rose again. But do we really understand the extraordinary nature of what we're claiming? Let me give you a modern analogy. We watched a fascinating webinar recently by um, someone called Nick Pope, who used to work for the MOD. He's retired now. Um, he emigrated to the US because his wife is American, but he, he had his career with the MOD. And his whole career was spent investigating UFOs, unidentified flying objects. And in summary, he said 80% were misidentified. They were prototypes of future aircraft or drones or something like that. So 80% misidentified, just don't count them at all. 15% didn't have enough data attached to them to make a judgment. Sometimes they were deliberate hoaxes. But 5% remained unexplained and worth investigating. There was evidence of UFOs, especially a particular one in 1980 in Suffolk, where a, a vehicle, I don't know what it is, sort of cone-shaped, diamond-shaped vehicle, was appeared on near a U US Air Force base, um, and it appeared three nights running. And the on the third night, the, uh, several of the um, people at the base left what they were doing, which was an, actually an awards ceremony, because they got the report that this thing had appeared again. And they went out. One of them actually touched it. And then when he did, it took off vertically. It was in a clearing in the forest. It took off vertically, just like that. Um, put down a beam of light which might have been a message, it might have been a weapon, they didn't know. And it accelerated very rapidly up through the trees, made scorch marks, and took off at a, an incredible speed. Afterwards, they went back to look the next day. And there were indentations in the ground, um, commensurate with something weighing several tons. There were scorch marks in the trees, um, and the people who had been there looking at it later suffered the effects of what was radiation. 
So there was something there. And this, this man, who spent, he knew, he was very, very knowledgeable. He wasn't just a, somebody making things up. Nick Pope. He, beca- he, he was started off as a skeptic, and then he, he then said, well, I really don't know. I cannot explain this. And then we know all about the James Webb Telescope. Well, no, we don't know all about it. We know that it's there. We know that it's giving us constant new evidence of the solar system, and that the laws of physics are constantly being added to. We don't know it all. The scientists are now saying there's increased likelihood of intelligent life on older planets than ours. And why not? And in the USA, where this this man, Nick Pope, is is now, he's keeping an eye on what's going on there, and they're making it very public that the Pentagon are making serious investigations into these unidentified flying objects and things that are seen. So they are learning, governments are learning, not to dismiss such possibilities, but to keep an open mind. The resurrection is something we don't understand from a human scientific point of view. But we Christians take it on trust. We don't have the second chance that Thomas had. But no one should dismiss it out of hand as a fiction. There's so much we don't understand, but maybe we don't need to. Perhaps we should just pray. Like the father in um, Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 24, who begged Jesus to heal his epileptic son. He said, I, yes, I, I do believe, but obviously I don't believe enough. And he, his words were, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Amen. We're going to sing and uh, stand and sing our third song, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
that we're having confession and some prayers, so perhaps you'd like to sit. Once again, there are parts where I'd like you to join in. Confession first. Merciful God, we turn to you in confidence to confess those times when we doubted you. Forgive us and help us. To confess those times when we have hidden from your presence. Forgive us and help us. To confess those times when we have been hesitant to speak of your glory. Forgive us and help us. As you forgave Thomas, forgive us when we don't believe, when we struggle and find it hard to share the joy of others. Forgive us and help us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your patience with us your acceptance of our doubting and questioning, and your assurance of forgiveness. How many times do we grieve your heart with our lack of belief and exasperate you with our lack of faith? But, like a good parent, you gather us to you and answer our misgivings. With you, Lord, there is infinite forgiveness. Amen. Sue's going to come up with our intercessions. Let us pray for a world in need of peace. Peace between warring nations Peace between conflicting political ideologies. Peace between people of faith. Jesus, please bring your faith, your peace. Let us pray for a world in need of love. Love for people who have lost their self-respect. Love for friends who have become alienated. Love for relatives who have lost their affection for each other. Jesus, please, please bring, bring your love. love. Let us pray for a world in need of hope. Hope in the midst of despair when all seems lost. When evil seems to be winning. Hope for a better future for everyone. Jesus, Jesus please, please bring, bring your love. hope. Let us pray for a world in need of joy. Joy when there is cause for celebration. Joy where there is a reason to give thanks. Joy as a means of sharing the world of creation. Jesus, Jesus please, please bring, bring your joy. joy. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn needs some help. So if you'd like to have some, there's two boxes at the front. Are you giving them out? Or or the children are going to come and collect them. This is where you like to make a noise. When I'm playing the piano, I find it rather difficult to keep the tune going. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll manage. There's two boxes. There's a box on either side, I think. Janet, just by the, by the... I think it's round there, isn't it? Jill had it before. Have you got the second box, Jill? Adults as well, please join in if you want. Make as much noise as you like. Anybody else want one? Put your hands up if you do. Adults or ever, we don't mind. Right, let's stand for the last hymn, the final hymn. A nice resounding one. To God be the glory. Thank you, Mark Murray. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loving the world that He gave us His Son To yield with His life and atonement for sin And open the light gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord the people 
proud father standing by the side. Thank you very much. Oh, hold on to a minute. Hold on. Gracious God, use this money and all that we have for the building up of your work in this church and the wider world for your glory. Amen. Sending out prayer. You need not doubt that God loves you. You need not be afraid of what others think of you. You need not be ashamed when you have only a little faith. For Jesus knows and cares for you and says, go to peace. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, do join us for coffee or whatever else we've been there. And don't make too much noise with your instruments. It was lovely to watch the adults trying to keep in time. <laughs> we'll have to train you, I think, sometimes, right? Thank you very much. All right. Bless you. That was brilliant.